many advocates of artificial intelligence have bought into the transhumanistic paradigm and they look forward to the day when humans can merge with AI. They feel that humans, as we are now, are in some way substandard and that this mechanical extension of humans into the electronic domain will enhance us. Maybe then we'll become ubermenches, supermen or overpeople as it were. But what the transhumanists are not realizing is that while we lack the cognitive ability, it's not because we're dumb, but rather because we're clever. Our higher thinking demands stratification and part mentalization. If you have clicked on this video, you probably want to become more aware and more empowered and more capable of affecting creative change in your life. Well, stay tuned in and let's see what we can learn about awareness and how indeed we can become more effective and even more content with our lives. If we look at a human being and compare them with an animal, the primary difference between the two is that although the animal is aware, it does not possess a rational mind that is capable of self-reflection. The cow in the field, for example, might have had some physical pain yesterday, but is not thinking about it today. Whereas the human being who has hurt themselves yesterday is still thinking about this pain today and probably worrying about it in some way. Indeed, not only do we reflect upon our experiences, but also we live in many parallel timelines at one and the same time. Our conscious mind is frequently divided. Take, for example, a man and a woman sitting down and having dinner together. Are they continuously aware of each other? Hardly, as throughout the dinner, both parties frequently remember some event that has taken place in their life or some work that has to be done or some thoughts that are on their mind. The man, for example, might be very eager to get back to work and finish his chores before he heads out to play golf with his friends. The woman, meanwhile, might be worried about an ailing family member and some bills which have to be paid. But it goes even beyond this, for the man might also sometimes be thinking about certain life issues, Maybe he's middle-aged and recently some friends and family members have passed away and he has thoughts and feelings which keep popping into his mind that he has no power over. They're morbid thoughts and they're disturbing him. Meanwhile, his wife has an ongoing issue regarding the relationship between her mom and also her own daughter. There are many variabilities in both of these relationships. She knows her husband does not either understand or does not care but she cares and it bothers her deeply. So just think of this meeting between this husband and wife. There are multiple timelines at work here as each one participates with the other in the meal in the here and now, but also they're reminiscing about the past, projecting onto the future and being disturbed by various interrupting or intermittent thoughts and feelings which are popping in and out all the time. What other creature on this earth demonstrates this level of complexity? None, of course. So we can see how our awareness is divided in many different directions. Now, this is useful because we're a complex creature and allows us to deal with the diverse aspects of our lives. But it can also denude our focus and our happiness. Endless interrupting thoughts can make it difficult to concentrate. Negative self-dialogue is ultimately self-defeating and continuously thinking about all sorts of random things is not a very useful way to spend our time here on Earth. Of course, we all have primary self-awareness, which involves our immediate sensory experiences, the sights, the sounds, the taste, the smells, and tactile sensations that we perceive in the present moment. This primary awareness forms the foundation of our conscious experience. On top of this, we have secondary awareness or meta-awareness, this is our ability to reflect on and monitor our own thoughts, feelings and actions. It's what allows us to think about our thinking, to recognize our own biases and assumptions, and to make intentional choices based upon self-awareness and introspection. Most of our entanglement takes place at the level of secondary perception. We are all pretty good at primary awareness, of being aware of our immediate surroundings, but this secondary level of awareness, this intra-awareness, is extremely complex and also compelling as we find our conscious awareness being dragged here and there. 
There are two key factors here which make secondary awareness or intra-awareness a complex topic. Firstly, our conscious awareness is strongly influenced by our subconscious mind. The subconscious mind, or unconscious mind, as Sigmund Freud would call it, is that which is occulted from our normal range of vision. In order for our conscious mind to be able to navigate its way around ordinary life, much of the back-end work of conscious awareness has been pushed into our subconscious mind. Our memories, for instance, our beliefs, and also our feelings are boxed into our subconscious mind. For a start, we could not consciously navigate our way around life if our conscious mind were filled with all the facts, data, and memories, so instead they are stored away somewhere in the subconscious mind. By way of a computer analogy, our conscious mind is a short-term memory, which is random access memory, RAM. So when we think of a computer, you can write something on a Word document, and when you go to get a cup of tea and come back, it's still there because of that random access memory. But if you suddenly switch off the computer, there's a good chance when you switch it back on again, that it will be gone because it's only in random access memory, short-term memory, and not long-term memory. Of course, you might be lucky and it might autosave, but autosave simply means that the data has automatically been transferred to the hard drive. So the conscious mind is like the short-term RAM memory, and their subconscious mind is like the hard drive. So our conscious awareness works like this. We are aware of what we have just done, what we are doing, and what we're about to do. But once we try and remember some past memory or obscure fact, we reach into our subconscious storehouse of memories for this. So our subconscious mind stores all sorts of memories, data, and also feelings. Sigmund Freud noted in his seminal work, Civilization and Its Discontents that the price that we pay for our advance in civilization is the loss of happiness through the heightening of a sense of guilt. The reason why we have so much guilt is because in order to fit in with society, we have to go against our instincts, which makes us want to either run away or attack somebody or engage in sexual activity. Obviously, in a complex society, we cannot all be acting out. So, the human mind has evolved to develop a thing called a superego or inner critic, which represses these aggressive and sexual uh, thoughts and fearful thoughts. A direct consequence of this are feelings of guilt and oppressive feelings, a kind of oppression which comes from the superego whenever we feel these thoughts and feelings arise. But this repressive mechanism is only partially successful, as ultimately these inappropriate thoughts and feelings emerge into our conscious awareness all the time. According to Freud, the dream is the royal road to the unconscious, because the dream is basically a wish fulfillment whereby repressed thoughts and feelings find their way into our conscious awareness via dream images and feeling states. But also, even in our waking state, our repressed thoughts and feelings keep on arising. Obsessive thoughts whereby we cannot stop thinking of something, for example, represent an attempt by these inappropriate thoughts and feelings to emerge out of their mind prison, as it were. Another common feature is displacement, whereby we do not know why, but certain events or memories make us suddenly more emotional. We might look at an old photograph or re-remember an old memory, and we feel some complex, waneful feeling. Or we might meet someone and feel an intense feeling, either a good or a bad feeling for no apparent reason. What is happening here is that the events and memories are connected to repressed thoughts and feelings, and they are being triggered. So, we are not masters of our own domain. Indeed, we are far from it. We possess a conscious awareness, but this conscious awareness is largely like a canvas, and the canvas is being painted upon by a group of people. But all the people are not great artists. Some even are monkeys, primordial aspects of ourselves at work. In particular, we see this in our violent and sexual thoughts, which keep on popping into our conscious awareness. There is an interesting challenge here for human beings in that a computer is far better at maths and programming than human beings. And yet some people are quite amazing at computation, but why not the rest of us? The reason why we're not so good at these computation activities is because the higher aspects of our minds have been built over these more mundane aspects and our consciousness in the process has lost the ability to do computational tasks efficiently. 
it is an interesting thing to note here that some autistic people are very good at maths and other autistic people are very good at art in the sense of creating picture perfect copies of reality much like a photograph also many autistic people have amazing memories the reason for this is, is that their higher level mental functioning has been disabled and so the lower level functions better the autistic savants are accessing parts of the brain which are largely inaccessible to the rest of us save for a very small percentage of people who we call polymaths people who against all odds have managed to have both the higher and lower functioning parts of the, of the brain working at the same time and capable of accessing these at the same time that's the higher thinking skills and the computational aspects to mind at the same time many advocates of artificial intelligence have bought into the transhumanistic paradigm and they look forward to the day when humans can merge with ai they feel that humans as we are now are in some way substandard and that this mechanical extension of humans into the electronic domain will enhance us maybe then we'll become ubermenches supermen or over people as it were what the transhumanists are not realizing is that while we lack the cognitive ability it's not because we're dumb but rather because we're clever our higher thinking demands stratification and part mentalization not just our cognitive abilities which are held back by higher thinking when i mean higher thinking i mean also our ability to think and refer to many different conscious timelines at one and the same time also i'm noting here the emotional life is hampered because of the heavy compromises which we've undergone in order to fit into society in some ways our minds are in a battlefield between aspects of ourselves which are at odds with each other and another feature is that human beings are the most sensitive creatures in the earth capable of a near infinite variation of feelings and subtleties and thoughts on one level this makes us very capable but on another level it tends to overwhelm our nervous system and indeed our conscious awareness becomes traumatized so we have traumatized thoughts and feelings which have their own ramifications because then repressive mechanisms come into play i know that earlier that a cow for example could feel pain but it would not remember pain whereas a human being will worry about a possible pain then feel the pain intensely while worrying about the future possibilities of this pain they'll continue to worry about the resurgence of the pain and it will start to become a mental drag as well as a physical drag also they will automatically evaluate the pain both in its physical sensitivities and also in the way it produces various states of anxiety and distress within us we live in a troubled world with many challenges some of these challenges are, are under our control but many are outside of our control our personal control but also society itself has many challenges such as wars conflicts and uh, many things which we have an inability to manage in our everyday lives and in society itself i noted earlier that our secondary awareness is influenced by our subconscious mind and that these con conscious interruptions make it difficult to navigate our way around life but also another challenge here is that not only does our subconscious mind infringe upon us in all sorts of warranted ways but also our secondary conscious awareness tends to be blinkered in that we are not fully open to the reality around us in a way this also relates to the subconscious mind and that our mind program or process which takes place early in life which is largely arbitrary in nature programs our subconscious mind and partly this creates a way of experiencing the world in general there's a form of psychotherapy known as gestalt therapy and in gestalt therapy the they have a cycle of experience that humans attempt to fulfill a cycle of experience so they can gain an insight so you start with an experience and it has to go through this full cycle in order for the experience to be integrated into us but the experience can be painful and so to avoid this the mind deflects the experience so that we are not even aware that we are having the experience in the first place it's kind of a denial of the experience for example you may have at some stage had the unnerving experience of meeting a person with several other people and that this person does not acknowledge you in any shape or form it's as if you're not even there sometimes this is because that person is a very ignorant person but in some cases 
this person literally does not notice you. You're actually outside of their vision, as it were. There was a trope that used to do the rounds of magazines and TV shows when I was a kid, whereby a man would have a secretary who wore spectacles, and she always liked him, but he never noticed her. Then one fine day, she took off her glasses and let her hair down, and suddenly she became the most exotic looking woman, and the man instantly falls in love with her. While this is a sexy secretary trope, there's also some element of reality in it. For example, there are many instances of two people falling in love, and upon hearing about their love story, it emerges for a long time that one was in love, while the other was unaware of that person's feelings, and perhaps only saw them as a friend, and then one fine day, mysteriously, they suddenly became aware, and they also uh, fell in love. So it's like they were not aware of their feelings towards this person. It just suddenly dawned upon them that they also love this person. It's actually extremely common. There are classic signs of a person expanding their conscious awareness. And when they do so, they open themselves up to the other person. They become open to each other and either love or in some cases friendship or mutual respect opens up in them. It's not that the experience has been that they're subconscious or impressed Rather, the experience never got that far. It was deflective for them. Okay. These are classic signs of a person expanded their conscious awareness. And when they do so, they open themselves up to the other person. They become open to each other and they either love or in some cases become friendships or mutual respect. It's not that the experience has been in their subconscious and repressed. Rather, the experience never got that far. Rather, it was deflected from them. They were not even aware that these feelings existed in the first place. Apart from human relations, this deflection of experiences can affect us in any myriad of ways. For example, while one person can drive a car perfectly between two small gaps, another person parks the car in front of the gap and asks a better driver to park the car for them. Sure, some people have amazing kinesthetic aptitudes, but surely most people can fit through a small space. Why can one person uh, find anything in the house and another person can never find anything. Why is it that one person is excellent at picking up social cues and another person is incapable of this? These are a few examples, everyday examples of deflection of experience in everyday life. So this is not repression, it's deflection. We only have to look at stage hypnotists to see that they can take a person who cannot sing and upon hypnosis they can sing. They can put another person under hypnosis and they can remember the color of their bedroom when they were five years old and so on. Why is this the case? It is the case for either one or two reasons. The hypnotist either bypasses the repressive process in the case of forgotten memories or he bypasses the deflection of experience in some cases earthing sudden abilities in the subject. In everyday reality we all possess a wide range of abilities and perception with some people having an amazing aptitude while others have a diminished aptitude for any activity. But there's rarely many outliers, so most people are actually in the average range. A hypnotist, for example, when he hypnotizes a subject and makes them sing, will not produce an opera singer. It is unlikely that they're that good, or at least they will only get that good with training. But most people can sing, most people can speak well, most people are good at arithmetic, for example, but they don't realize that they can do it. And we see this on a daily basis on the stage with hypnotism. Ultimately, it doesn't matter that they're not real singers or that we're, 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 we, we, need, we need a calculator. We can get around these easy. We can buy a calculator or buy a phone. We can listen to other people sing problem solved. The bigger thing here is how do we navigate our overly complex conscious awareness, which is influenced both by repressed thoughts which could be finding an unhealthy outlet in terms of either obsessive thoughts or worries inappropriately bursting into our conscious awareness when we should be studying or working. Or secondly, deflection of experience is deflecting or blinkering our reality and making us less capable of fulfilling our true potential because we are not as capable of dealing with reality. Our reality checking is reduced because we are blinkered. So what are we to do about our conscious awareness so as to lead a more productive, a more content and fulfilling life?
this is an enormous subject and I can only touch upon it in a very small way here. Also I'll follow up in another video next week which looks at the occult consciousness. But here are a few things which you can do to boost your conscious awareness and lead a more productive and fulfilling life. The first point is to realize that you are far more competent than you might think and to stop depreciating yourself all the time. Also when we look at the psychology of awareness we can see that not only do we need to stop judging ourselves but also we have to stop judging others as well because most of the ineptitude which we see in the world today is a direct consequence of people being unable to function at their highest level and by and large it's not really their fault. The point that I want to make here is that being a human being is a very complex task indeed. And imbalances are there in each and every individual who's walking on the earth today. I see everywhere a lot of hurt people who feel bad about themselves and bad about others. They judge others and feel that others are giving them a hard time. And it's about time that we stop playing the blame game either on ourselves or on others and instead we need to start realizing that we are human beings, we are basically sick people, we are mentally sick and are attempting to find a way forward. Each and every person in this world to some degree is mentally ill. The world is a tough place and life and society on an individual level it's all complicated and difficult to navigate and the blame game is not going to get us anywhere either in a collective or on an individual level. So we have to begin with acceptance. Self-acceptance first and acceptance of others next. And the second thing to consider is that the narrative is determining your life. And what I mean by narrative is the stories which you tell yourself. We are all raised in a certain environment and we are all conditioned by it and we are programmed by it and also by our family members, school teachers, neighbors, relatives and society itself is influencing us from an early age. Now this is both a good and a bad thing. It is good that the early life programming helps us to fit into society. We don't have to learn everything from scratch. We can kind of plug and play as it were. But also it's a bad thing here because we download a lot of junk files, as it were, another computer analogy, at one and the same time. Now these junk files affect us negatively in two ways. For us, see, they provide us with limiting beliefs, some of which reside in our conscious mind and some in our subconscious mind. This conscious mind we know about, but the subconscious one we do not know about. Carl Gustav Jung, the famous Swiss psychotherapist, would label this as a shadow self. The shadow being all that is affecting us, but we do not know about it. So it's difficult to work in that which you cannot see. Secondly, it limits our perceptual range. We become unaware of that which we should be aware, and this is a real problem. We are blinkered. We are not responsive enough to deal effectively with our, our various life challenges because our reality checking is off and we're full of cognitive dissonances because we're trying to work within this blinkered state. So we have to begin by accepting ourselves and others and next we have to work on becoming more aware of ourselves. Yes, our secondary awareness may be lacking because of deflection and to some degree also repression. But we can work in the same way we might go to the gym and build muscles. Uh, we can also beef up our intrapersonal muscles. We can get to know ourselves better and while we may never get to a a true picture of ourselves, an objective picture of ourselves, we will make some progress along the way. The third point then is that once you start becoming aware of yourself, and you can do this by self-help work on yourself, such as reading of books, watching videos, attending seminars, diary writing and meditation, then a quick overview of the sort of things that you need to do. But once you gain some insight here, you can start tidying up your conscious awareness to some degree. In other words, you, you, you learn about yourself, but then you start constantly thinking about, is there ways that I could be tighter in my consciousness? If we're candid with ourselves and evaluate our daily thoughts and feelings through a diary, after a short while we'll start to see that we actually spend a lot of time thinking about necessary things. How many times a day can you think about sex, for example? Or about diet? Or some chores which have not been completed? Or how much time do you spend with inane thoughts like pondering about some aspect of life just for the hell of it or having an argument with someone in your head about which TV or movie character is better or trying to prove to a lover or family member in your head a fancy version that you're right to buy the blue color car rather than the green one 
we're carrying around these city self dialogues and also just city thinking like uh, we keep thinking about the sports results or or uh, or or maybe some video that you watched uh, explaining how the you know how maybe you might fly a kite or something I think what would be the best way to fly a kite do you need to spend much of your time thinking about this stuff no you have to you know like a a a herdsman or a herdswoman will herd in the sheep you have to see your thoughts are like that wandering around the field you have to tighten them up if we are honest about our thoughts we are all over the place now I'm not suggesting that we become uh, machine like far from it our creativity is the greatest thing and having diverse points of view and diverse interests is also really great but some discipline needs to be required and this is where humans fall down because we're our mind is not disciplined our mind we are not masters of our mind our mind is not balanced we have to balance it to some degree so take the news for example it's full of all sorts of fear-based stuff it's designed to disturb you look at uh, celebrity news for example it's designed to destabilize you like you look at podcasts on on youtube well most of them are full of nonsense talk or they're full of gossip or insinuation or conspiracy theories that will scare you half to death now I'm not saying that you should not watch the news or podcasts or tv shows but you have to become the master of your own mind and know when to engage and when to disengage a large part of training a mind is to know when we are, we are think what we are thinking and feeling right now and how to rein in our thoughts and our feelings say for example you want to get to know yourself and you want to do self help work you can watch a lot of great videos about how the mind works but if you watch an endless amount of videos after a while it might become a little heavy you might become a bit depressed feeling because it's too much about the mind the mind the mind or the problems of the, say you watch uh, a lot of conspiracy news for example the, the problems of the world or global warming whatever so we can create a lot of anxiety so we have to know i've watched enough of that now i've read enough of that now i'm going to take a little break we have to be that's our job as the ego is to decide oh that's enough we have to start doing that rather than just you, know, you click on the shorts for example and you just go bum 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 or reels or whatever so we have to make a point of focusing on what needs to be done right here right now and put other things to aside to give them a certain time slot but don't focus on them all the time. Also try and cut down on speculative thought in general. It's it's great to research uh if you have a goal uh, it can be fun to gossip and uh, we all like to uh, um um examine different options in life and think about things after all that's one of the key aspects of being a human being but we shouldn't do too much. We have to rein it in. A key discipline which will help you here is meditation. Meditation trains the mind. Personally, I really like heartfulness meditation. You can find more about it at www.heartfulness.org. It's a free and highly powerful meditation system. You can try it and uh, and see how it works for you. Uh, meditation will really help you uh, ground yourself. We live in a world of illusions. of outer representations a person might look externally like a great success they may have wealth and power good looks a happy family life and charm but what's going on inside them what do they really feel and think well, more importantly how is their inner self and do they even know themselves what is their conscious attention what is their conscious awareness the majority of people in this world are in a real mess inside An analogy here of the inner self looks like a uh beaten up house where everything is messy and there's dirt everywhere and people who live there that's the sub personalities inside ourselves are all starving looking their clothes are hanging off of them and they're skinny and sad looking so externally a person might look very successful but their inner house of being might be in a in disarray and a mess so people will often have endless external activities to keep themselves occupied so they don't look within and see this mess within themselves the world can only become a free place when the majority of people in this world have progress enough so their inner self is at least some semblance the same as their outer one the inner self will always be a bit of a mess after all it's a work in progress but we have to feed our inner self we have to clean up our inner environment and we have to make a disciplined effort to become congruent in our own lives 
What I mean by congruence, we think of maths, is like two things are aligned together. Well, our outer and inner life have to be aligned together in order for us to be effective and to be happy as individuals. So when we're thinking about the, 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 the psychology of attention, human beings have a massive challenge before them. And our thoughts are continually being pulled all over the place. And we, we can have a tendency of thinking that we're kind of dumb or we're stupid or humans are stupid and dumb. No, humans are very complex. But there's so much complexity, it's hard for our conscious awareness to be here now and deal with what we have to deal with. So we have to become aware of those complexities such as repression, such as deflection, and to understand that the various uh, traumas and feelings that we're having result in these thoughts coming out at a very inappropriate times. That the result of uh, deflection, of course, is we're blinkered to certain things, we're not aware of certain things, which creates a kind of a cognitive dissonance within us. So it's hard for us to be objective. And also our mind, the third major thing here is our mind is just pretty undisciplined. We've just, because there's no proper training of the mind, so we, you know, if you watch, say, those Star Wars movies of young Jedi Knights, little kid Jedis, learning how to be Jedis, but we're not learning how to be Jedis. We're just like, whatever. So as long as you look externally like you're okay, fine, but you could be dreaming all sorts of things, fantasizing all sorts of things. They could be very bitter, they could be sadistic, they could be silly. There's no inner discipline. And I'm not saying you can't fantasize or have fun, but we have to become aware of what we're doing and then permit ourselves, okay, right now I'm fantasizing, fine. Right now I'm focusing on my work, fine. We have to work at reigning in our mind and using things like meditation to make our mind stronger and of course self-development work so we become more aware. And striving over a period of time, which means it's going to take a while, to become more and more congruent between the inner and outer self so that we are more happy, effective, uh, and content human beings. I hope you like this video. Please like and subscribe if you do. And I'll talk to you next time.